We've been on quite a journey during Lent. We put ourselves in the stories of Holy Week for some time now because they are important to our faith journey and our identity as followers of Jesus. We have been freeze-framed into moments in Holy Week so that we might put ourselves in the picture and enter the passion of Jesus. Tonight, the characters we have experienced by zooming into the works of art will step into our picture. We will hear from them again, but this time they come to us knowing the rest of the story. Some of you may remember Paul Harvey's radio show, show where he would tell a story. He'd set up the dilemma, but after the commercial break, he would come back and tell the rest of the story. He would offer some surprising twist. Holy Week is a time to mourn the continued suffering in the world, but we do so knowing the surprising twist of the story of Jesus. We are Easter people as we live in the post-resurrection era that reminds us that suffering and death is overcome when we follow Jesus' command to be agents of change in a world that so desperately needs a word of resurrection hope. I invite you to join me as we travel back to the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life before the parade. Remember me? I was the one on the ledge overlooking the parade of Jesus. I was fascinated with what I had heard about Jesus and perhaps downright scared. But I showed up outside the gates to the city that day to watch his entrance. And then things got more intense in Jerusalem that week. I don't even think intense covers it. Horrifying. Roman executions are almost always gruesome, but this one held the message of see what we do with saviors. The morning of that parade, the crowd was chanting, Hosanna, which means save us as if a man on a donkey could free us from the fascist and oppressive Roman regime. 
Looking back on it in hindsight, it turns out that the donkey was part of this message. Fighting evil with the ways of evil, answering might with might, just cannot be redemptive. But coming into the picture and showing a different way to have power, the way of mercy and compassion, nonviolence and forgiveness, that is the response that God requires. And it changes things. Because in the end, no matter how death-dealing things are, no matter how low and loud the voices of hatred and fear are, resurrected life comes in the light of love as we use our lives to show a different way to be to the world. This is the rest of the story. Now, in a moment of silence, I invite you to think about something that has your heart gripped with fear or even loathing. Ask Jesus to save you from it and show you a different way. And we'll take a moment in silence. Let us pray. Jesus, Savior on a humble donkey, empty us of our need for revenge, answering hatred with hatred. Let your compassion be our compassion. Amen. Now I invite you to picture yourself in the large Gentile court of the temple. When Jesus turned over the tables in the temple, I was filled with fear and frustration. I was afraid he was about to get himself killed, well, and, well, he did. It was the risk he took, and in doing so, he showed us that pursuing justice is risky, still is. You have seen many bold and righteous leaders cut down since my time. I was so angry at the events that unfolded that week, angry at the way things are. Yes. It is part of the redemption story to feel the anger at the way things are and try to do something about it. But I know it is hard to see whether anything we do makes a difference when the pain continues. I certainly felt that there was no hope that last week in Jerusalem, especially as we watched our beloved one die on that Roman executioner's cross. But then... There was the rest of the story, and what rose of, out of the death, death was something that gave us all the courage to live on and spread the news that death will not win. And as I see you standing here, I know what truly lives on has more longevity than any political power of any one era. You are part of the rest of my story. Of Jesus' story. That is the long arc of justice. In a moment of silence, I invite you to imagine that your actions toward a more just world, small though they may be, are part of the rest of the story for humanity. Ask Jesus to show you what you can do out in this world to be part of that picture of justice. And let us pray. Jesus of righteous indignation, give us courage to be part of the arc of justice that you proclaim. Let your passion be our passion. Amen. And now we move on to a visit inside the temple where Jesus was teaching. I'm the one who was in charge of keeping an eye out on Jesus whenever he showed up at the temple to teach that week. It was fascinating to see how the crowds adored him. And then, when it looked like he really was going to get in serious trouble, 
how some people got really frightened and started staying away or even turning on him. But I have to say, if you are someone whose life depends on towing the line, hiding your true feelings or true identity for fear of punishment, it is not an easy thing to stay strong. Fear is a powerful thing. Fear keeps us all small and sometimes silent when we should keep speak up. Fear is a terrible master. I even saw some of Jesus' closest friends, his disciples, deny that they knew him after the crucifixion. Even the best of us succumbs to fear. I can tell you that even as a Roman official, I felt the fear that night as he was dying. What has become of a society in which a teacher, a rabbi, a nonviolent person is deemed such a threat that the state cannot tolerate them? That they must be extinguished? Are we so fragile that we cannot even engage one another without resorting to death? Well, this seems to be a question for your time, and perhaps for all times. Can the rest of the story in that fateful week allow us some hope that we can rise again, rise above, rise up from the ashes of our own dysfunction? I invite you to take a moment of silence to imagine what it would like to be part of the work of God, transforming the way we deal with our differences. Ask Jesus to teach your heart to love someone who is different from you and that you struggle to understand. Let us be in a moment of silence. Let us pray. Rabbi, teacher Jesus, teach us to love beyond our differences, to look closely at how we might change the rest of the story. Let your understanding be our understanding. Amen. And now I invite you to move to your table, if it's nearby, and take a seat. Well, here we are gathered around tables, just like the times we disciples used to eat with Jesus and whatever unexpected guests he had invited. I told you the story of the woman who came in the, that night in the last week with the expensive oil and how we complained to Jesus about it because we were concerned about money and survival. And then Jesus reminded us that money and survival are not the most important thing in the world. Actually, how we spend our time and love while we are here is the thing that should be concerned about. And then the rest of the story happened that week. He was right. She was preparing him for his burial. We did see his earthly body violated and tortured and killed. And we did tend his body in the ways it is done, with burial oils and linen cloths before laying him in the tomb. In fact, it was the linen wraps left behind three days later that gave us the evidence that the tomb could not hold him, that death could not hold him. It makes me wonder what linen burial wraps cover our own eyes right now so that we cannot see the true and present blessings of our lives right now. How much does our worry about the future steal from the present we have before us? And now in this next moment of silence, I invite you to recall the blessings of your life right now. Ask Jesus to help ease your worry about the future so that you can live life fully right now, even now. Let us be in a moment of silence. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, anointed one, open our eyes and help us shed the death clothes we are already wearing in order to see the light of new life in every single day that we have. Let your abundant hope be our abundant hope. Amen.
My life since that night in the upper room was never the same. As a servant assigned to the room, I witnessed an amazing act of servanthood unlike anything I'd ever known. The honored guest took my towel and wrapped it around his waist and took on the duty of washing feet that was my lot in life, my station, one that was supposed to define my life forever. Everyone in the room was stunned, but Jesus didn't stop there. He went through more of the rituals of Jewish meals, adding in strange words and prophecies that had everyone on edge. Turns out he knew just what he was doing, for his words became eerily true as we all witnessed the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood in the days after the meal. He dared speak of a new way of being in relationship where all people are of sacred worth, of equal stature, and this was such a threat to the status quo that he was killed for it. But here you are, and I see now that the rest of the story shows up whenever you gather around tables where all are invited to be present and to feast on the love and grace that is each person's birthright as a child of God. I see a vision of a time and place where even, and especially, I have a place at the table. When we break to get bread together as a church in our worship, we remember that Jesus invited folks to his table as part of his ministry, not just at the Last Supper. So we wanted to create a way for all of us to break bread together with whatever we have at our homes. Indeed, what we've asked you to do is to prepare your favorite comfort food, if you will. And I invite you to share with the group gathered online what food you are bringing to the table today for our virtual feast. And you can put your comments in the comment section or you could email them to us or you can text your friends. See, Jesus used the parable of the, of the great banquet to which all people are invited in order to talk about what the kingdom of God, the family of God, looks like. He said, go to the highways and back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. He often invited the most unlikely guests to his mealtimes, confounding the disciples. In this way, he was encouraging a deep love and connection between and beyond differences, going beyond social norms. He knew that we humans need connection and inclusion. And Jesus comforts us saying, you have a place at the table. And Jesus challenges us to make sure we are doing the same, that all people know they are welcome in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, even if we can't physically be with each other right now. It's very difficult in this moment right now not to be near some of the people we love and might be worried about. We understand that. I want you to take a moment in your homes and say aloud, or if you want to put those notes in the chats and the comments on the side of, the, of our... Uh, YouTube presentation, do so. But put the names of people you were you wish were right there next to you at your table today. And I just want to pause for a moment to give you a chance to do that. Jesus is no longer physically on earth. Yet every time we gather around a table and we call him to mind, he is present with us in spirit. And so too our loved ones are with us. Let this be a comfort to us. But we also want to call to mind the people we cannot name, whose names we do not know, but we know they need our prayers and God's comfort. Prayers for those who have lost loved ones for those who are sick and recovering, for those who are caring for loved ones who are sick at home, for those who are caring for persons in medical care, for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are feeling alone and isolated, for those who are helping and are so very, very tired, 
for those who are struggling to find friends, food, and comfort. For those who are afraid. And for those who risk their own health to provide for all our needs. I invite you to take a deep breath. On behalf of all those we do not know and cannot call by name. And as we do so, we know that God knows who needs our prayers and who needs the Spirit, who needs the breath of God right now. And the breath of God is blowing from within us outward as a spirit of compassion and presence. Pause again and take a couple of deep breaths. What a blessing it is to breathe. Blessings at the table are part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Indeed, Jesus adapted his Jewish rituals, blessings spoken before and after meals. He asked us to remember him whenever we break bread and raise a cup in thanksgiving. This is why we call our communion prayers the great thanksgiving. In this feast of love and comfort, we can call to mind things for which we are deeply grateful. I invite you to speak aloud a couple of things that you are grateful for at this moment. And so I invite you to raise a plate of something on your table, or a glass of whatever you're drinking, and let us bless it in this way, repeating after me with all of you who are there at home. Holy Comforter, we gather in your name. Invited by Jesus. Bound together with your spirit. In union with each other. Feed our bodies and our spirits. With your comforting presence. So that we might be your comfort to others. Bless this food and break open our hearts. Bless this drink and pour out your love. Amen.
After Jesus had spoken, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You aren't also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby Jesus struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed.
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death that he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against them, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement or the Hebrew Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king, they cried out. Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest said, answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them.
This painting by James Tissot is titled, What the Savior Saw from the Cross. For over six weeks, we have been taking various perspectives in the story, but never this one. This perspective from the cross is Jesus's view. He looks down and sees with the eyes of compassion. For all of us, the good news is not just that life wins out over death in the resurrection, but also from the cross, in the moment of sheer agony, Jesus' passion was compassion for the suffering of humanity. God knew our pain. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I was one who fell asleep at the garden. Remember me? Later, as I looked up at the cross where Jesus was dying, I was, I was overcome with remorse that I could not even stay awake at the most important moment of my life. A moment where perhaps I could have protected him. But then, he had plenty of opportunity to protect himself, and yet at every turn, he chose to speak the truth. Ours was not the only time in history when the truth was difficult to hear, though. Truth and goodness seem to remain elusive in most time periods, even the one you live in. Perhaps we continue to follow Jesus, who said that the truth, the way, the life, is that which leads to freedom, not captivity. That which gives life rather than takes it away. That which proclaims love rather than hatred. That which feeds people, not stars them, in body or spirit. That which builds community, now breaks it down. And that which takes suffering and transforms it, creating beauty in the world and life as a work of art. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. 
These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I invite you now to come to your table, your altar, and stay there for our benediction. And then you may go in silence. Look at what happens when we put a frame around life. We zoom in and find there is good news. We find the rest of the story. It will all be okay. Jesus is with us. It will all always, be okay. Forever. Jesus is with us. It will all always, be okay. Forever. It Jesus will all be okay. Us, always, Jesus is with us. Forever. Always. Forever. As we have done with the art and stories we have encountered in this season, we are reminded right now of the beautiful life we are given. It's the very reason why we often place flowers on a grave or remember a beautiful life in those moments of remembrance. It always reminds us of the beauty of life lived with attention and intention. May you all be blessed by the sacred frames that surround the moments of your life that you dare not miss, go in peace.